Good evening and welcome. I'm Zita Strickland from Pacific Science Center, and I'll be your host for tonight's virtual Science in the City Talk. Thank you so much for joining. We appreciate you taking time to connect with us this evening. Before we start tonight's talk, I have a few bits of information to share. First off, we've uploaded some of our past Science in the City talks, including events called Community and Justice, Urban Conservation and the Human Wildlife Coexistence, Earth Day, Now More Than Ever, and Mysteries of the Deep, Seattle's Underwater Secrets. All of these have been uploaded to our Pacific Science Center YouTube page, including many more videos for you to explore. Educational like programming like this tonight is made possible in parts thanks to the generous support of donors. In face of challenges like COVID-19 and climate change, science and an informed public are absolutely essential. If you're able, we suggest a $10 donation for tonight's event to help us ensure that curiosity never closes. For more information about donating to Pacific Science Center, please visit pacsci.org slash support. Now, we have a great presentation lined up tonight all about the history of exploration on Mars. And during this talk, I'd like to encourage you to put any questions that you have directly into the chat window right there on the YouTube page where you're watching this video. After the formal part of the presentation, we'll have lots of time to ask our presenter questions directly from you. So be sure you're recording those questions and we'll ask them afterwards. Now, all of this tonight is about NASA's exploration of Mars, which has a super long history. And it's a very timely week to be talking about exploring Mars, which you'll hear why. Beginning in 1976 with the Viking landers and continuing to this year with the launch of Perseverance, there's a long history of exploring on Mars. What's changed? What's remained the same with exploration? What's next in the future? Well, tonight we're gonna to hear about insights and lessons learned through the exploration of Mars, examining the past, the present, and the future. To make that possible, we're joined tonight by Chris Voorhees. Now, Chris has decades of experience, including the implementation of robotic systems for the exploration of deep space, including as a mobility systems engineer for NASA's Spirit and Opportunity rovers, and he was the lead mechanical engineer for NASA's Curiosity rover. And for his efforts, Chris has received NASA's Exceptional Achievement and Exceptional Engineering Achievement Medals. Today, Chris is the president of the Seattle-based First Mode, a design, engineering, and systems development firm. At First Mode, Chris oversees engineered solutions for missions around the globe and throughout the solar system, including the Mars 2020 Perseverance. Chris, welcome tonight. We're so glad that you're able to join us. Hi, thank you, Zeta, and thanks uh, again to the Pacific Science Center for the opportunity to talk uh, today on this topic. It's, uh, it's my favorite topic to discuss, and um, uh, as we were talking, uh, it is, um, uh, uh, while everything has changed since we originally talked about having this topic on Science in the City, one thing that didn't was celestial mechanics, um, and as Zeta alluded to, um, uh, this talk is at a very interesting time um, in, um, in celestial mechanics. Every 26 months, uh, Mars and Earth are at a particular alignment uh, in their orbits, their, their separate orbits around the solar system that enable us to uh, send a spacecraft uh, to Mars to explore. Uh, and we are in the sweet spot, the keyhole of that right now. Um, and there are three missions uh, on their way to, uh, or uh, to be on their way. One already has left and two to come. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, as I get into my talk. Um, the, uh, the, this 26 month cadence of being able to explore is, is part of what I want to, the part of what I want to discuss today um, because it has set up a rhythm uh, to the way that we have looked at the, uh, the red planet. Um, and um, while uh, uh, at this point in our history, there, there could be a lot of folks that are listening that kind of take for granted the, um, the, uh, um, the presence of robotic systems on the red planet and the fact that there's a rover there. 
Um, it's been that way for many, many, many years. But it wasn't really all, always that case. Um, a set of decisions and events and some, and some plain luck has led to what now is um, a really expansive, uh, involved and thought out program of decades of exploration. And uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk to you about the history of uh, particularly how we have uh, started to explore in a mobile sense the surface of Mars, um, how the missions that have developed over time are connected, and uh, you know, where what we've learned, what we've explored, and then uh, hopefully some fun facts along the way. Um, a little bit of background before I get into some detail. Um, uh, the, the real like modern fascination with Mars uh, started when we could build telescopes uh, on the ground that were uh, large enough and uh, um, uh, large enough to resolve features that started to get interesting for the uh, celestial bodies around us. Um, a, a gentleman by the name of a businessman and philanthropist by the name of Percival Lowell uh, built one of these large telescopes with his own, uh, with his own cash and prizes uh, and his own uh, property in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, and uh, for 15 years uh, was uh, kind of obsessed with the planet Mars, wrote about it, explored it, uh, um, uh, took astronomical observations of it and became convinced that there were a set of non-natural objects, canals, reservoirs, uh, and that uh, through his series of books and writings, you know, fascinated the public at the turn of the 20th century. Um, it really wasn't until the 1960s that we could start to um, confirm or refute a lot of Percival Lowell's assumptions about the red planet. Um, when we first started to send spacecraft there, uh, flyby and orbiting spacecraft as part of a series of missions called Mariner, um, which were happening uh, around the same time that the Apollo missions were happening and exploring the surface of the moon with our astronauts. Uh, and they didn't necessarily find canals uh, and they didn't necessarily find reservoirs, but they did see uh, interesting features that looked like um, Mars either was or at some point in the, in the past was wet and had water. And so the tantalizing possibilities of life were still there. Uh, and as uh, Zeta mentioned, uh, we um, uh, actually landed on Mars um, uh, through a kind of a brilliant set of feats of engineering uh, and a spectacular achievement at the time, almost like the better part of 50 years ago um, with two missions called Viking uh, that consisted of um, a combination of an orbiter uh, that would take pictures uh, and map the surface and a lander uh, landing in two, uh, two different locations on the surface of the red planet. Um, and uh, the, um, the results, I would say, were mixed. Um, we landed, uh, saw what looked like um, a, a desert, um, uh, did some exploring uh, and um, had one big question that we wanted to answer about uh, whether there was the existence of life. And the res results were ambiguous, inconclusive, controversial. Um, and uh, to some extent, uh, um, uh, started to get folks a little bit less interested in exploring. Uh, and a weird thing happened. Um, 20 years passed. Um, uh, between what was, uh, like I said, a, a, an out, outstanding engineering and technical feat of being able to do it at all, um, and the next time we went back. Um, so what happened? Um, like why was there this gap? Um, well, the other mission, and I guess this is the first time that I'll say that you can't really talk about um, space science and space exploration without talking a little bit about politics uh, and money. Um, and at the time, the other predominant space science mission was the Voyager missions uh, to the outer planets. Uh, and that grand tour was starting to return some pretty amazing and tantalizing results about Jupiter and Saturn. And as we got from the 70s into the 80s, the priorities of NASA's space science missions 
uh, were on two other flagships, um, the Galileo mission to the Jovian system uh, and Cassini to Saturn. Uh, and uh, that took us from the 70s into the 80s and into the 90s. And quietly, uh, um, the results of the Viking mission and Mars exploration in general took a back seat uh, to these grand flagships. Um, Viking hadn't really interested, either the, the results of Viking hadn't interested the scientific community in the way that Voyager had. Uh, and it really didn't engage the public uh, and it cost billions of dollars and was incredibly complicated and no one really wanted or was compelled to repeat it. So we kind of stalled out for two decades. Um, so we needed to find a new path, a faster, better, cheaper path, smaller maybe, definitely bouncier. So how did we get to that path? Um, a few other um, events, politics, and other elements uh, uh, factored in to where we went next. Um, so now let's fast forward to the early 1990s. Um, and there's a little bit of a, a push now to start Mars exploration again. Um, and uh, NASA has kind of multifaceted plans. They're being buoyed by the first Bush administration's space exploration initiative, which had targeted Mars and human Mars uh, um, exploration by last year, actually. Um, so we didn't quite make it. Um, and so uh, that um, started to invigorate the robotic exploration of Mars again. Uh, and um, in uh, doing so, um, a mission called Mars Observer, which was a high definition a uh, camera and high, uh, like a reconnaissance mission to really, really map in detail the system and do some on orbit scientific uh, observations uh, um, was on the books and being developed. There were plans for a big rover um, that was being demonstrated in the desert. And there was a kind of a companion mission that was called Measure, which was the Mars Environmental Survey which was a set of landers, 16 in all, that would spread out over the decade in the 1990s and explore um, a little bit more cost effectively several different locations on the surface. And then when we found one that was really, really good, we could send uh, um, a, a bigger, larger rover there. Um, that uh, system, uh, that, syst that program of projects uh, was kind of put into a blender after the failure of Mars Observer. Uh, Mars Observer was lost um, on uh, at uh, Mars orbit injection when it fires its thrusters to slow down and go into orbit around Mars. The spacecraft failed, it was lost. Uh, and that whole idea of exploration kind of went, um, uh, kind of needed to be replanned. Um, around the same time, there was a new, uh, there was a new, uh, way of looking at space science and exploration at NASA called the Discovery Program. And the basic tenet of the Discovery Program was, um, uh, let's not put all of our eggs in one basket. Um, let's not have these big flagship missions like Galileo and Cassini. Uh, let's, um, let's make it competitive. Let's let scientists come up with ideas, uh, um, team with engineers, uh, and propose different explorations. Uh, and when uh, and do that more cost effectively and do it more in more numerous ways. When the program kind of fell apart, um, the discovery program was there um, and a gentleman by the name of Dr. Matthew Gollenbeck at JPL proposed uh, that we send a pathfinder for the measure um, uh, strategy. Uh, and they called it measure pathfinder and it won the second discovery competition. Uh, and um, it, uh, and so it was, it was called Measure Pathfinder, and then eventually it was called Mars Pathfinder. Um, Mars Pathfinder was unique in that it didn't use lander legs. Uh, it uh, uh, approached uh, the uh, Martian atmosphere directly, entered, used a supersonic parachute and some retro rockets to slow down, and then inflated this big set of airbags and bounced around on the surface. And this was thought to be more cost-effective uh, and 
um, and more amelior, uh, um, more uh, tolerant of the unknowns that we would see on the surface. So that's what came out. Mars Pathfinder was the result of a program that had a lot of other moving parts at the early 1990s. At the same time, um, a gentleman by the name of Don Bickler at JPL uh, had invented a new way of, um, of roving and a six wheeled su a suspension system called the rocker bogey suspension system that um, uh, could drive over obstacles that were twice the wheel diameter and, and way more mobile than a conventional four or even six wheeled platform. Uh, had patented it and they built a technology vehicle uh, because when they asked to build a full scale vehicle, they wouldn't let them because it was too much money. So they built a one eighth scale mock-up. Uh, they called it Rocky. Uh, and that became a companion called the Mars, a micro rover flight experiment that was then added to um, the Mars Pathfinder mission. Um, that vehicle um, dropped its kind of sanitized name, micro rover flight experiment, and was eventually named Sojourner Truth after the um, uh, 19th century abolitionist. Um, so Sojourner became uh, Mars Pathfinder's companion. They were really two separate projects, but then came together with one common objective. Can we cost effectively uh, and uh, in a very quick pace in, uh, in just about 30 months, design, develop, integrate, test, launch, and deliver a new spacecraft to the surface of the red planet. Uh, Pathfinder was launched in late 1996. And because the spacecraft navigation gods were with us, landed precisely on July 4th, 1997 in Eris Vallis on the surface of Mars. Um, the interesting thing about Pathfinder was that it wasn't really a science mission. It was a technology demonstration. Um, and the, the team at JPL, um, which included me at this point, I was a college student that was working there as a cooperative education student. Um, the goal of that team was do it for way less. In fact, do it for less than one tenth of the cost of the Viking missions. Uh, and so this mission uh, got to the surface of Mars, landed, deployed its vehicle for less than one tenth of the cost of Viking. So now folks were interested. This isn't gonna be a billions of dollars thing. Maybe we can uh, take a different tack at how um, and where and when we can explore. So it really opened folks eyes about what you can do. A couple of fun facts about uh, Pathfinder. Um, in order to test the airbags, we used the world's largest vacuum chamber in at Plumbrook Station as a part of NASA's Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, we built a giant platform uh, and uh, put rocks on it so that we could test in this rarefied air how the airbags would land, how they would not tear, and how they would survive a glancing blow on the surface of Mars. Another interesting fact about the airbags, they were built by the International Latex Corporation, ILC, who also made uh, the Apollo spacesuits. And I really couldn't get through this presentation without talking about the Martian once. Um, and I'll only talk about it once. There are several different things and, and avenues we could go down the Martian. And you can definitely ask questions if you want. But um, uh, one of the things that featured prominently was Sojourner as uh, the traveling companion uh, and uh, kind of a pet. And one of the things they got drastically wrong was how fast Sojourner moved. Um, and uh, Sojourner had a maximum cruising speed of less than one centimeter per second. And so not the greatest of pets, um, at least it wouldn't be my first, uh, first choice. So Pathfinder set the tone. We can go faster. We can do it more aggressively. We can take chances. Um, we can do it differently than, than biking. Um, and so where did it lead to? Well, the next chapter is a couple of robot geologists, or as they were first referred to, a rover in a bag, which I will get into in a second. But first, a little bit more politics and some science. Um, 
1996, right around the time that Pathfinder was being shaped up and ready to ship to the Cape and be put on top of a rocket and launched, um, uh, some, uh, a group of scientists had discovered that um, in a Martian meteorite, ALH, a ALH 84001, which is an Allen Hills meteorite, um, a Martian meteorite, so a piece of Mars that because of its chemical and mineralogical composition and its age, we can tell definitely came from the surface of Mars, had evidence of um, bacterial microfossils in the meteorite, and therefore those most likely came from the surface of Mars. This was a big deal at the time. And uh, since then, it's been a, a it is, I've been considered a controversial find and one that folks are still working on today and writing papers about. Uh, but it was enough for, you were probably wondering why I have President Clinton on here. It was enough for Clinton to um, uh, make some announcements and some policy changes and talk about it in the Rose Garden uh, about the potential of us finding the evidence of life on another world. Uh, and despite the controversy of the finding, what it really did was propel our interest in uh, um, Mars, in learning about life, in studying it, uh, and um, really propelled the, uh, the field of astrobiology a little bit and made it a little bit more in the mainstream. Uh, and at JPL, the effect was, we gotta go back there. We gotta go as quick as possible. Our next mission should be a, a, a a sample return mission so we can go grab rocks and bring them back to earth and evaluating them in our laboratories and, and determine whether there's life there. So we were working really hard on a sample return mission when this happened. Um, there were already two spacecraft in development uh, after Mars Pathfinder, a, a twin set called Mars Climate Orbiter and Mars Polar Lander. Uh, and in 1999, both of those spacecraft failed. Uh, Mars Climate Orbiter because of a bit of a metric English snafu that you can read about if you don't know about it already. Um, Newtons and pounds are different and that's important, uh, especially when you're navigating a spacecraft. Uh, Mars Polar Lander uh, uh, did not land successfully and failed. Uh, and so that was a dual failure. It was embarrassing uh, for the Mars program and it sent it back uh, to the shops to try to figure out what to do. Uh, and in early 2000, there were a few options. Um, uh, and one of the dark horse candidates was, let's rip the guts out of Mars Pathfinder and stuff as much rover into it as we could. That rover will, of course, be a tetrahedron. It'll be a weird shape in this pyramid, but uh, it'll unfold. And uh, then it can go out and explore. Uh, and out of three or four different candidates for what could happen next, uh, the Mars Exploration Rover was the winner. Uh, and that was later called Spirit and Opportunity. And really what they are is a robotic field geologist, it carries a toolkit. It has stereoscopic imagery about at your eye height. Um, it has an arm that's kind of like your arm. Uh, and it can walk around, it can, it has spectrometers to tell what's, uh, to, what, to look at composition. It has a, a microscope it has a little imager. Uh, it has a little tool that kind of braid away rocks. So it's like a field geologist. Um, doesn't go very fast. It's a five centimeter per second vehicle. Uh, and it was designed to have an, a 90 sol or Mars day life and drive about a kilometer. And at first there was just one of them, but about, half, about, about a year into the project, we, uh, there was a decision to make two uh, and send twins. Um, and fast forward a couple of years ahead, um, the development of the missions was just about 30 months. So it was just as breakneck as Mars Pathfinder. Um, this is Spirit um, in that very same clean room that you saw Mars Pathfinder um, uh, uh, doing its first drive test um, uh, before it gets sent uh, to the red planet. Um, but when it gets sent, it doesn't look like that. It's all folded up. Uh, and tucked up inside of this lander. And most of the design of that system has nothing to do with roving, but it has a lot to do with surviving that bouncing airbag impact uh, and being able to just make it to the surface at all. Uh, spirit and opportunity, twin vehicles, 
scent, as I said at the beginning, we're in the keyhole. The keyhole is about three, three and a half weeks of time that you can send spacecraft to Mars. MER A and MER B, as they were known at the time, and uh, were named Spirit and Opportunity during the launches, um, like right before the launches. Um, uh, they launched in that same window. So one at the very beginning of it and one at the tail end of it um, from two pads, pad 17A and 17B uh, on two Delta II rockets. So they were sitting right next to each other uh, uh, right before they launched. Um, both spacecraft made it to the surface of Mars. Um, one at Gusev Crater, Spirit on the left, uh, and one uh, Opportunity. Um, and so now our next 12 wheels are on the surface of another world opportunity at Meridiani Planum. Um, so these are two rear HASCAM images, hazard avoidance cameras, um, looking back at that first drive on the surface of Mars um, from the landers, because they had to kind of escape and get away from the airbags and before they could actually venture out on their own. And venture out they did. Um, they lasted much longer, which I will get into. Uh, but this is Spirit and its tracks at Husband Hills, more than three, three and a half kilometers away from the original landing site. And this is Opportunity, um, making its way out of Eagle Crater um, and uh, venturing out onto its own at the beginning of a very long voyage, uh, where it tra uh, transversed cliffs at over its stability limit, where it found and discovered uh, and imaged clouds on Mars and cloud patterns, where it found dust devils uh, and frost um, because it's staying now over seasons. And so now we're seeing weather on Mars and it turns out that weather was very, very useful. Um, not only did it whip up dust devils, but it cleaned off the arrays on those on the solar panels of the solar powered vehicles um, and made them last much, much longer than anybody actually expected uh, or ever really dreamed. And the final thing that uh, Spirit and Opportunity found was evidence, evidence of past water, which was really what it was looking for. And it found it at both sites um, in uh, blueberries. Uh, what we're uh, colloquially called, but it's little balls of hematite that are formed um, uh, in uh, like acidic shallow seas. Uh, and uh, at Spirit, um, uh, Spirit lost one of its wheels during its traverse uh, and was dragging it. And in dragging it, it created a big trench. Well, they discovered under this trench, this white powdery material, just silica rich. Uh, that we would not have seen had we not been dragging the wheel. Uh, and that likely and almost assuredly forms in either um, acidic hot springs or, or steam. So two places opposite each other on the planet, both with evidence of past water. And as I mentioned, the vehicles lasted much longer than was expected. Spirit um, went for uh, just around seven years and drove about eight kilometers. An opportunity was a workhorse for nearly 15 and drove uh, over a marathon length, 45 kilometers. Um, so uh, a much larger yield on return than the 90 day mission that we had originally thought uh, would be a, a gift. A couple other facts about Spirit and Opportunity. Around the same time that we were um, getting, uh, sending them to, the, to Cape Canaveral, uh, in January of 2003, uh, the Columbia Space Shuttle was um, a broke up on reentry and the crew was lost. Uh, our, a part of our crew for building uh, and integrating the vehicles was already there at the Cape when it happened. Um, we decided to memorialize the astronauts and the mission uh, and both uh, Spirit and Opportunity carry this plaque on the back of their high gain antenna uh, in memory of those lost astronauts. Uh, and uh, before we even built Spirit and Opportunity, we built demonstration vehicles uh, that could help us understand how to explore and how to even operate on the surface. Uh, this is the Field integrate, Integrated Design and Optimization Vehicle in the Mojave Desert called FIDO. Uh, so we like our acronyms. 
And finally, if you've got it and you're re ready to celebrate and you just watch a successful launch, Rover wheels make excellent vessels for champagne. Just file away for future reference. So where did spirit and opportunity lead? The real next step was we need to send a much bigger vehicle and put a laboratory and take a science laboratory and a geologist laboratory and put it on the surface. Well, that's a bigger problem. And now this vehicle is the size of a car. How are we gonna do it? Because airbags didn't scale and regular landers with legs didn't scale either. And so there wasn't enough mass and volume to be able to fit it. So um, uh, the team at JPL came up with um, the sky crane landing technique, which is basically taking the, the lander and flipping it on its end uh, and saying, well, how about instead of putting a, ro a lander below the rover, we dangle the rover uh, from the lander and uh, use the wheels of the vehicle as its own landing gear. And that was the only way that we could really close um, the mass story and send the laboratory that we wanted to and intended to, uh, to the surface. So we, the airbags got thrown out and now it's Skycrane. Um, I, I just wanted to show this one because I wanted to get across that every vehicle starts really ugly and only the designers can like it. And so a 550 kilogram vehicle in April, 2004 became an 890 kilogram vehicle by August, 2007. A lot of design between those two points and uh, a lot of complexity in making that system work. Uh, but really what this is, is a mobile laboratory and it's not looking for water anymore. It's looking for habitability. It's got a drill, it's got a, a mass spec um, and it's not solar powered, it's nuclear powered. Uh, same cruising speed, sorry, no, no, no faster. But now it's a Martian year and 20 kilometers of traverse. So a uh, more expansive and uh, more deliberate investigation now, um, because we've kind of answered the question about past water, but really did that lead to habitability? Uh, that vehicle was built uh, and tested in those same clean rooms and in those same facilities uh, where Pathfinder, Spirit and Opportunity um, came into being uh, and were sent on their way. Um, different here in that um, uh, the rover has to be tucked up and surrounded by its jetpack, what we call the descent stage. Uh, and you see what's called the powered descent uh, vehicle configuration here, which is the descent stage and the rover together. Um, and you, I think you can tell in this picture, you have to design them, they're intimate with each other. Um, one looks the way that it does because of the other. Uh, and a couple of things to point out. There's a piece missing uh, that I'll go into in a bit. Uh, and these uh, engines over here, these descent stage engines, along with these reaction control thrusters, and basically all in-space propulsion that we've used in exploring the solar system has come from the Seattle area, from Woodenville uh, and a company named Aerojet Rocketdyne um, that really help us move around in the solar system. Um, and so there is a Seattle connection. Um, uh, the left-hand side shows the spacecraft right before it gets its heat shield. And so now you see how intimate the uh, rover is with its entry system. And it's a bigger vehicle, so it was launched on a bigger rocket. This is uh, the United Launch Alliance's Atlas V rocket. Uh, and it left in uh, 2011, uh, the day after Thanksgiving. And it landed successfully uh, very in very dramatic fashion uh, in late August of 2012. Uh, and the interesting thing about this rear HASCAM image, as opposed to the others, is there's no lander back there. It's like the rover uh, appeared out of nowhere and its tracks just started. Um, and that's the sky crane, just dropped it right off. Sky crane flies away and then uh, disposes of itself about a couple of kilometers away from the landing site. Other interesting thing that happened on the way down, another spacecraft called the Mars Reconnaissance or, uh, Orbiter or MRO 
captured what I think is probably one of the most awesome pictures uh, in like robotic space exploration history. This is Curiosity on its way in during entry, descent, and landing with its parachute captured by MRO's high rise, uh, high resolution imaging camera. So uh, you've got a bullet with another bullet aimed at a planet, aiming at each other, taking this picture. Um, that's what we can do. That's the power of math right there, big time math. And what did we find when we got there? Well, we landed in Gale Crater, but really the, the goal was Mount Sharp. And Mount Sharp was this place that just had looked like from orbital imagery had this enormous stratigraphy uh, and these, these mountains that would have uh, billions of years of geologic record. Uh, and that was the place that Curiosity wanted to go. And um, the vistas of the pictures that it's uh, uh, returned are astounding. Um, here's a picture of Mount Sharp um, as the vehicle explored. And then a few other telltale signs of um, uh, past water events. Uh, and um, in the bedrock, in these odd alien features uh, that look that have stratigraphy and then are worn away in three eighths gravity uh, and uh, form these. Um, oddly familiar, but a little alien features. Um, and then around along the way, it'll capture fascinating uh, things like a solar eclipse. This is Phobos passing in front of the sun. So it answered the question of habitability. Um, and really it was looking for the presence of organics, which it found the building blocks of life and how the atmosphere evolved and whether it was um, uh, at some point habitable, um, and what the water and carbon dioxide cycles look like. And all of those elements pointed to the fact that in the past, at some point in its past, Mars uh, had the ability to ha that was water and had a habitable environment. Some other facts along the way. Um, spacecraft gets signed by lots of people. Um, the engineers uh, make it uh, their point to try to hide their signatures on things. Um, but in this particular case, um, uh, this is Clara Ma, uh, and she uh, won the contest for naming the, the, the spacecraft Curiosity. And part of, that, um, part of that award was getting to sign the belly pan of the rover. Um, and so that's her signature. Um, and uh, so she's one in a long line of uh, elementary and middle school students that have named Sojourner, Spirit, Opportunity, Curiosity, and perseverance. Other people sign the spacecraft. Uh, this is what we uh, refer to as the Obama plate. And so this, are, this is the president, the vice president, the office in, of science and uh, technology policy, NASA administrator. And so this exists on spirit, on opportunity, on curiosity, and on perseverance, I'm sure. Last fact that's interesting about curiosity um, it uh, doesn't get fully assembled until it's on top of the rocket. The um, spacecraft is uh, powered by a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, and it produces an, in, uh, an incredible amount of heat. Uh, and so if we had, uh, put it on early, it would actually melt the vehicle. And so because of its radioactivity and its heat, it's installed at the last possible minute through a door in the launch shroud and through a door in the aeroshell. Uh, and then bolted onto the back of the rover about three days before launch. So that leads me to the next chapter, the one that starts next week, Perseverance. Perseverance looks a lot like Curiosity and most of its bones are related to that vehicle. Um, but um, its uh, mission is much different. Now, instead of searching for habitability, it's searching for biosignatures, the potential of evidence of past life, and the preparation for human exploration. And it carries a helicopter. Um, ingenuity as a flight experiment, um, just to see uh, about the challenges of sending a lightweight vehicle for uh, helping to augment exploration uh, from the air. 
And it carries one other important thing. Um, uh, this is uh, perseverance, once again, with the, heat, with the heat shield removed and the belly pan removed, at least part of it. And what you see there, uh, surrounded by a bunch of people with really good protective equipment, are those folks protecting the hardware from them. This is um, Perseverance's most critical payload, a set of sample tubes. Uh, and it's the first hardware that's been sent to Mars that is designed and intended to come back. Um, so the next mission will go and pick up the core samples that Perseverance collects and puts in these uh, tubes and bring those back as part of a sample, to, sample return mission. So that's why I say this has all been leading to this. The mission uh, is just about there. Um, that's the spacecraft on the left and the top of the launch vehicle with the spacecraft inside on the right. And we're just a, uh, just a, a little over a week away from launch. So to close this out, um, what, what's really happened since the early 1990s is a sustained program of exploration that's really going after one theme. Uh, where there's water, there might be habitability. Where there's habitability, there might have been life. And answering those questions has really been um, uh, one of the successes of robotic space exploration. And it's mostly an American success with a lot of international support. And more joining right now, the United Arab Emirates uh, with Japanese help just sent their Hope spacecraft uh, in, uh, uh, and it's on its way um, to orbit and explore the surface of Mars, or to orbit and explore Mars from, from orbit and measure um, uh, the Martian atmosphere. Uh, and the Chinese are sending their own uh, rover, orbiter, and lander um, uh, in just a few days. Uh, what has that resulted in? A continuous robotic presence on orbit around Mars really for, for 25, almost 25 years, and a continuous robotic presence on the surface for almost 17. And three generations now, scientists and engineers have participated in that cadence. And I uh, put on the right, uh, when I was looking for a map of Traverse for Opportunity, I found this and just thought it was so clever because um, it really lays out time. Um, this is a map of uh, Abby Freeman, uh, the last, mer uh, last uh, Spirit and Opportunity Deputy Project Scientist. It, it's her career. Um, when uh, Opportunity landed, she was a junior in high school. And before uh, it was over, um, she was the Deputy Project Scientist. That's how long that mission went. And it's generational in nature. So I'll close with one final image, my favorite image, which is from the Spirit Rover uh, in Gusev Crater. And it's a picture of us. This is a picture of Earth in twilight from the Martian surface. Um, Spirit really was taking a picture that no human can take because the air on Mars is poisonous and rarefied. The nighttime temperatures meet, reach like minus 120 C. The radiation will kill you. Um, and it's very, very, very far away. Um, but yet it's very familiar and it makes us ask questions. There's a story in all of that and a story for us to discover. Um, the machines are really our representative, these rovers, um, these landers, these spacecraft. Um, they're our proxy. They bear witness to the events on a surface of another world and they explore where we can't, at least we can't yet. Um, and they're really more than machines actually. Um, they start to embody the people who care about them um, they're the combined heart and souls of the scientists that planned them, the engineers the, that designed, built, and tested them, and really the public at large, um, because uh, these are shared explorations. And I think that's a really unique thing about the Mars program, um, is that we get to explore together. Um, you see the images come down live right along with the scientists, uh, and you get to explore with them. Um, and there's not a lot of ways for us to be able to do that these days. Um, and I think it makes it really special. Uh, and uh, it's just, just a heads up, the next chapter on that exploration, it starts next Thursday. So with that, I'd like to once again, thanks, thank the Pacific Science Center for the time and thank all of you for uh, your attention and uh, just being uh, involved in this and uh, happy to answer questions. 
That's great. Thank you so much, Chris. This is, it's such a fascinating history and it's great to see it presented in just such a, a linear way to see how each mission's built on the next one. Um, as you said, we're gonna move now to the audience question and answer portion. So everyone who's been watching from home, any comments or questions that you have, please put them in the YouTube chat. And Chris, I'd love to start actually with a question that combines a little bit of Mars and you in here. How did you first get excited about Mars? Um, what about the engineering that pulled you in? <laughs> I mean, it was. Um, I, I, uh, my first mem one of my first memories is watching um, uh, space shuttle landing tests and the shuttle Enterprise back in the late 1970s as the space shuttle program was happening. And then in high school, um, their, uh, vo the Voyager spacecraft flew by Neptune. Uh, and I thought that was ridiculous, um, that that was even possible at such a tremendous distance. And to get some uh, glorious images of what up to that point was just a, a fuzzy dot in a telescope. Uh, and that was just another, um, uh, another system of a planet and its moons. Uh, and I, I think I decided right then um, to, uh, that this was kind of what I wanted to do. Um, I went to school not knowing how that would work and um, uh, was fortunate to um, get a, um, a real opportunity still as a student to participate and work uh, and learn um, at JPL. Uh, and that, then I just caught the bug at that point and it was all over. I love that your story starts um, from a young age watching. So what advice do you have from, you know, for anybody, any kids who might be watching the launch next week that are interested in this, what advice would you give? What do you wish that you knew? Oh, <laughs> uh, well, it's the opportunity that the, this connectedness that we have now um, enables uh, young people. Um, and uh, like that, that example that I gave, um, that was like on one TV channel and I just was able to watch it because someone decided to broadcast it. Um, but it's just a totally different situation now. And um, what, my, what my recommendation would be is that if you're interested, um, it, it is a very real um, option to explore with the scientists and engineers. Um, imagery comes down from the, the vehicle uh, and everybody gets it at the same time. Um, and I think it's, um, it's really democratic in the way there's no sequester on that information. And so you see it along with the team that's evaluating it for NASA. Um, and uh, in that way, like you can uh, explore, um, you can explore right along with them. Uh, and um, and there's really no stupid question in that um, because um, as I remember when we landed in, uh, on Opportunity and we took our first pictures, uh, the principal investigator, Steve, uh, Steve Squires, I remember um, the flight director asking, it's like, well, what do you see, Steve? And he said, like, I have no idea. It looks so alien to him. And what we were staring at was bedrock. The first time for seeing what was probably a lake bed um, on the surface of Mars. And he just didn't know what to think. And so uh, that's a human uh, reaction. And uh, it doesn't matter what age you are, you, you can all have that. I do love that, that curiosity and, and that figuring things out. I think that's a great connection actually to a question from Brandon, which is asking, when you're looking at these geological features, how do you know that it's evidence of water and not some other fluid, for example? Yeah, well, uh, first, first response is that I'm not a geologist. Um, <laughs> It's a combination of things. Um, it is um, it is the nature of the geometry of the geolo the ge geological features, how they formed, and the story that that formation tells, and then the mineralogy um, and what the composition looks like. Uh, and there are some of those telltales, both in the shape and form, and in the mineralogy that really can only form in the presence of water. Uh, and in some cases, the presence of water that flows. And so you can start to see the difference between um, a salty sea, like a stagnant sea, uh, and uh, rivers or, um, or uh, a, a river bed. Um, and so 
like opportunity was most likely sitting in a salty sea. Um, uh, curiosity is exploring where there really was flowing water. Um, at some point, because of some set of events for some time period, putting that story together is really complicated. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's what the team is trying to do is, is try to put that full uh, complexion of the history of, of, of how we, um, of when it was, how it formed, oh, what was it more than once? Um, were there more than one of these events in the billions of years that Mars has existed? And then where is it? Where did it all go? Why is it not that way today? Um, this is a very compelling story. So with all those different questions about Mars, and it's a, you know, it's, it's not as big as Earth, but it's still a big planet. We haven't spent, sent very many rovers. How does a scientist decide where to pick a landing spot? Oh, that's a that super landing location can they actually achieve? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a little, it's like a democratic process, actually. There is um, the entire, like, Mars science community is engaged in what's called landing site selection. Uh, and so the engineering team uh, basically places a set of restrictions of like, these places look like they're safe. These is, this is the criteria that we would need to be able to put the vehicle on the ground safely. And this is an area that, these are areas that we think um, we could explore. Like they're accessible by the rover. Um, and so there's a set of like, there's a bat, like a box um, that has, to, there's a lot that then, um, uh, can be argued about. Uh, and really, individual scientists or teams of scientists, they get together uh, and they propose to each other, um, I think we should go here. Uh, here's why. And they tell the, the, the scientific story around why that site is superior to other sites. Uh, and then they argue about it passionately. Um, and, uh, and it isn't uh, until... Um, actually much later in the development, like the vehicle is designed and it's being built, that that selection gets winnowed down uh, into like a primary uh, Jezero crater where, um, where uh, Perseverance is headed and a backup. Um, and, uh, um, but that process is one of um, spirited debate, really is the best way to put it. Um, and then consensus about what the right balance between risk and scientific reward is. I can imagine that some of the safest places to land may not be the most interesting geologically, and some of the more interesting geological places could be the rockiest, bumpiest, and not safe places to land. Yeah, like Valles Marineris might, is a pretty awesome place to potentially go, and very, very difficult technically. As a like a, an example of a place that I would love to send a robot, um, mostly just to see, um, just to see the the largest, deepest canyon in the solar system. Um, but it's a bit of a trick, um, several tricks actually. Um, and so um, it, it, it's not necessarily one of the first ones that would make the list. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you had talked about it, Mars isn't just rocky, but there's some really harsh conditions. Um, but if it's so harsh, why is that someplace that we would want to send humans? What are we hoping that we can achieve with a mission like a humans to Mars? Well, yeah, so there, I mean, there's a lot that you can, uh, the, there's a lot that you can do with robots. Um, but um, as uh, the, in, in talking with the scientific community, uh, it, it, you, you'll get the, you'll, you'll quickly realize that what they could do and what they could figure out just by being there in 30 minutes, it might take us two or three months to do with, with a robot. It's slow. Mm -hmm. Methodical. Every one of those steps has to be planned, um, and it's um, despite the fact that they get increasingly intelligent. Um, like we, what we haven't talked about is just how just how a, a much smarter perseverance is than spirit, and what it can do, and how it can protect itself, and how it can do uh, the job of exploration on its own. You're still limited, um, and you're still limited by what you can uh, carry, and you're still limited by um, the interpretation. Uh, and the context that you have around it. Um, and so there's no real set, there's no real still replacement for a human explorer. Um, and that's not even getting into um, the other reasons, the other compelling reasons that we just want to and feel um, the drive to explore, um, which 
have led us to the moon and, um, and uh, potentially to Mars um, in the not too distant future. That's more than just uh, science though. That's, um, that's um, human endeavor, mm -hmm. pursuit of, 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 of something else. Yeah, for sure. I, I think this is a great time to ask some of the questions that have come out about rovers themselves. Sure. Um, and one of, the, one of the things you were talking about was they're, they're very slow moving. Kevin is curious about why are rovers so slow? Is it a safety measure? Is it something to do with the size of motor that we can send? Um, is there a desire to make them faster? Uh, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, uh, it is a bias, really, of the of the of the engineering team um, when you're under limited power, and so uh, and so really the limit is power, um, and the uh, rovers um, Spirit and Opportunity had about 100 watts to work with, um, and had to run everything in order to be able to do that. Um, uh, so does Curiosity. Um, it has it continuously. Um, it doesn't have to rely on the sun. It can rely on the big hunk of plutonium in the back to create some heat. But still, it's 2,000 watts of waste heat. And the effect, the thermoelectric effect that creates the watts, it's like 5% efficient. So you only get 100 watts. You get it all the time. But you got to be real. You got to conserve what you're, what you're doing. And so power is the real limitation. Uh, so you can, you can go fast without a lot of torque, or you can have a lot of torque and you don't go very fast. And so what we'd never want is for the system to not be able to get itself unstuck. And so um, you um, uh, bias yourself towards um, uh, more torque than speed. Um, and, uh, and then the other thing is that it doesn't necessarily need to go faster because there's only so far that the science team is gonna want the vehicle to go before they take another look. Um, and really, you only get one chance per saw to put instructions up, and then the vehicle goes off and drives and goes out on its own. And it can still move pretty slow and accomplish that. Um, so a little bit is a bias of safety of the vehicle, and a little bit is that it, it doesn't actually need it, at least in the way that we explore today. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned you only communicate with the rover in one soul. So how long is a Mars soul? Is you know, and, and soul meaning a day. So how long is the Mars day? And why is it we only communicate with it once per day? Yeah, it's sometimes you get more than one chance, but generally um, uh, you, you might only you might just get one. Um, uh, a Mars uh, day or soul is twenty four hours and thirty eight minutes, so it's very it's eerily close to Earth. Um, mm -hmm but it's just a little bit off um, so that if the team has to work Mars time, um, they get all messed up. Day becomes night, night becomes day, two weeks later, it's night again. Because um, every day is 38 minutes, is it longer than the previous day? Yeah, so that can mess with you a little bit. Um, the, uh, but um, really it's, um, it's just uh, the orbit, it's the rotation of Mars, it's the, um, and it's the rotation of Earth, and it's access to the deep space, deep space network, which is a set of radio telescopes that we use to communicate. And interestingly enough, a lot of our communication and most of the data, like 99% of the data that comes down from the vehicles, it goes through an orbiter. Uh, and, and a lot of it goes through that same Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, MRO, that I mentioned. It, mm -hmm. it, it's got a really big dish, uh, and it can talk really fast back to um, Earth. And so the rovers use UHF to talk with that um, orbiter, send information up, and then later the orbiter will relay it back. Um, so that timing and that cadence also limits the number of times that you can... Uh, and um, I'll communicate with the vehicle on the ground. Wow. Okay. So it's a little bit of a self-driving car once those instructions are given. Well, very much so. Um, it uh, it used to be that um, you would, uh, and still uh, a, a common way of driving is is called waypoint navigation, where the you would plan for spots out in um, the navigational imagery that you take you'd set those waypoints and then the rover would drive to those waypoints uh, and you would plan it um, 
pretty deterministically. And then the rover would only go around that if it detected a hazard that you didn't see. And so it's using its own imagery to um, stereoscopic imagery to see maybe a hole or a rock that wasn't um, present in the image and the, and the drivers, the, the planners couldn't see. Um, increasingly though, um, the rovers are smarter uh, and can start to contextualize that plan on their own uh, and um, get more and more freedom to uh, change that path uh, and make it more efficient. But it's really on its own, um, which means the, the first thing and the most important thing that it needs to do is to stop when it, when it doesn't, when something doesn't feel right. And so it has to be able to do that and protect itself against something that, uh, um, uh, it's better to just run home, like phone a friend and find out what happened. Yeah, then, then call for help from the scientists instead of going off call for help. Yeah. into a small crater on its own. Um, so I got just a couple more questions that have come in that are great about the rovers. And then I'm gonna pivot to a few more questions about you and some of your current work. Um, and the sample caching system and the sample return definitely had some, some excitement generated in the YouTube chat. So can you just for a quick moment talk about what that involved to make that and what are we hoping that we'll learn from that sample return? Yeah, so um, it really, as I said, like this whole program has kind of been leading to this point because the, the ideal mission is uh, to, um, uh, to grab a sample, a pristine sample um, mm -hmm. from the surface and bring it back to like the world's best laboratory um, and analyze it like with instruments that um, you cannot miniaturize and send to the surface of another planet. Uh, but that is, um, I have often thought that we might send human uh, explorers to the surface of Mars before we can do a Mars sample return mission. It is very difficult. Uh, and the most difficult part of it is um, keeping the samples uh, pristine uh, and not contaminated with um, with Earth, actually, um, despite how clean we try to keep vehicles, um, it's almost inevitable that life kind of gets in places that you don't want. Um, in fact, they found bacteria growing in clean rooms that they never found any place else on Earth, despite how clean everything was trying to be. Um, so uh, it is an enormous problem of trying to design hardware that can be sterilized to the extent kept sterilized um, uh, and then sealed in a pristine way to um, uh, protect the integrity of a core sample that the drill collects from a target that the rover has determined is um, has evidence of past life from its perspective. And it goes, this is a good target. Um, and you acquire that core sample, deposit it in that tube seal that tube and then at a certain critical point in the uh, um, in the mission they will drop those off so that they don't get stuck inside of the rover if it dies in a crevasse or it dies in a weird orientation they will put those in a spot that another vehicle another robot can come and collect and in the design of that spacecraft and that actually set of missions that has already begun um, and that's really the next chapter is going and picking up what Perseverance found. That is pretty amazing to think that we can do that. I don't, well, jury's <laughs> not. Uh, yeah. But um, uh, we tried to do it 20 years ago and it was just definitely too soon. We didn't know enough about Mars. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't know enough about how to, how to clean, how to keep things clean and how to, how to get that mission to work. Um, and now, like, just overall, we're in a much better position to be able to make a, uh, to be able to take that step. So you're not at NASA anymore. Um, what motivated you to, to found this new company that you have, um, First Mode? Uh, well, I, um, I actually left, um, left NASA because um, one of the, uh, one of the, arcs there that was might have been a little bit harder to see was that as as the rovers got bigger they they all got they got more expensive the teams mm -hmm. got bigger, uh and um the uh stakes got a lot higher 
Um, uh, Curiosity, as an example, was a two and a half billion dollar spacecraft that had no spare. Perseverance is a $2.7 billion mission that has no spare. If it blows up on Thursday next week, that's it. Uh, we wait a very, very long time for another opportunity. Um, Sojourner, not the same. That was like a dozen people on a vehicle um, with all the stops pulled out uh, and uh, really taking chances and trying to push the envelope of what was possible. Um, and that's really where I learned how to be an engineer um, and in that environment. Uh, and um, I wanted to see uh, whether we could recreate that environment outside of NASA while still helping uh, with um, the uh, help move and propel those missions forward. And um, there's also this potential of um, the techniques and tools that you use in solving a problem like a Mars sample return mission and kind of moving those and, and solving problems on earth um, uh, in water management and clean tech in um, cleaning up our act uh, and uh, um, big hairy problems that we, we deal with here. And so I was interested in um, how portable those skill sets might be um, that I'd gotten honed on this very specific problem. It's like, where else might they be useful? Mm -hmm. Oh. What keeps you up at night? Oh man, you mean about <laughs> either in, in terms of yeah, in terms of Mars, I'm, I'm sure you're still connected to and thinking about that mission, but also in the priorities that you have with First Mode. Yeah, I, so like with Perseverance, like we're very close to um, go time, uh, and um, a lot of the folks that are still at the Cape, um, um, ready to do that RTG integration that. Um, uh, putting that, you know, nuclear battery on the back, that, um, that is extraordinarily complex. It's a very tedious operation that happens at the very end and everything else is ready and you can't screw it up. And so I think about that team a lot um, and what they're about to go through. Um, and, um, and also that um, despite all of those efforts, it just takes one thing to go wrong uh, and, uh, and that effort of multiple years of thousands of people, um, you lose it. And so it, it makes you kind of like, you have to enjoy the journey a little bit. Um, I've still in my, in my career, I've had more failures of, of vehicles that I worked on than successes, um, uh, in one form or another. And so you kind of have to get used to it. Um, because, um, despite how good we've gotten at exploring space, um, it's still very, very unforgiving. So I have two quick questions to end with. One is, what are you excited and curious about for the future? Um, so the, um, so like with the Perseverance mission, um, I, I am, um, there's, there's kind of three things I'm super curious about is do we find telltales um, of, um, of life, of previous, of past life, um, and it, to the extent that we're like, we should bottle this up and get ready to send it back. Mm -hmm. um, like, does it clear that scientific bar? Um, there's an experiment on board Perseverance that takes carbon dioxide and turns it into oxygen. It is a demonstration for um, pathfinding for human exploration um, because it's something we're going to need to do. I, I'm, I'm tantalized by that um, experiment. And then uh, the frickin' helicopter, um, uh, I, I'm reminded of how it felt. Um, like we were kind of a passenger and working on Sojourner. Um, and, and really the, the main mission was just to show that we could get to the surface of Mars cheaply and efficiently. Uh, and then we were kind of this like tag along, uh, but the tag along kind of stole the show a little bit. Uh, and at the same time, I can trace like everything that we've done back to that success in the way that we explore the Martian surface. And so uh, what doors will that open in success? What new ideas will we get and, and find in how we explore because of that, um, that really a technology demonstration of what, what's possible. So I'm excited about those elements and seeing what happens. Yeah, the helicopter is pretty exciting. Um, final question that I'm going to ask you is actually from Casey. I'm going to bring it up because you would also reference the Martian. 
So current TV, do you have any thoughts on the show Space Force? Keep it in mind, I've only watched the first two episodes, so no spoilers. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, um, uh, I, I'm uh, looking forward to season two. Uh, <laughs> And I think like there's a lot of, um, there's a surprising amount of interplay between uh, scientists, politicians, and the military. And, and really it goes back generations of um, how, what are really like three groups that should really despise each other uh, because they're just not in the same regime at all, how they can work together on making, um, yeah kind of miracles happen um, are, um, I, there's like lots of stories there um, uh, that I think could make, they make great dramas, they make great comedies too. Um, but like, I, I mean, maybe, maybe it's not very well known that, you know, the 45th Space Wing of the Air Force, uh, they launch um, the, the spacecraft out of Cape Canaveral. And so, uh, and um, you know, they're neck deep in supporting those missions. They just do it in a way that you know, folks don't really uh, don't really see, uh, and they're kind of behind the scenes. And so um, there's a lot of uh, material to draw from there. <laughs> I'm seeing what they do with it. <laughs> that sounds great. Well, I want to thank you, Chris, so much um, for joining us tonight, sharing your time, your expertise, and your experiences with us today. Definitely given us a lot to think about, and I'm super excited to follow along this mission with NASA with the launch date of next Thursday. My fingers are definitely crossed. Thank you to everybody watching at home and joining us with your fantastic questions and sharing those tonight. We hope that you've enjoyed tonight's event. Um, we would love your feedback. Your feedback is very important as we shape future events. So please take a moment and fill out a short survey that will be put in the link in the chat and then also email to everybody who's registered. If you've also joined tonight's talk, you can share it with friends and family. This talk will be saved on the Pacific Science Center YouTube page, so you can share that link. Remember to sign up for our e-newsletter at pacsci.org slash SITC, that's SITC for Science in the City, to learn more about upcoming talks that we have. Be sure to donate to Pacific Science Center at pacsci.org slash support. I want to thank you again, Chris, so much for joining us, and thank you for everybody watching and remaining curious with us. Have a great evening. <laughs>